Marshall Applewhite convinced 39 members of Heaven's Gate to cover their heads in plastic bags and commit suicide as part of their wacky belief system. You got it for just $5.75, a pair of Nike tennis shoes, and a purple shroud. The members of Heaven's Gate boarded a UFO trailing the Hell Bop Comet. <laughs> well, beam me up, Scotty. We're talking Colts. Well, welcome to Profiling Evil Podcast and Season 2, Colts Among Us. If you're new to our channel, thanks for checking us out. If you've been with us for a while, welcome back. But either way, please, folks, take just a moment, hit the like and the subscribe button. Please don't forget to ring that bell so that you get all of our notifications. Now let's get talking Colts. Colts are described as a group defined by unusual religious, spiritual, or philosophical beliefs. The group usually has common interests, particularly in their ideologies, their personalities, objectives, or goals. Mainstream religion is considered by some people to be cultish in nature, while other people look at newly formed religions as cults. When looking at it from a criminal perspective, I find it much easier to look at the group's leadership, their organization, and group requirements. In short, is the cult destructive in nature? A destructive cult will ultimately cause physical, emotional, or financial harm to its followers. Dr. Stephen Hassan, an author and educator in the area, and a mental health counselor suggests that destructive cults are usually pyramid-shaped authoritarian regimes with a person or group of people that have dictatorial control. These groups use deceptive recruiting techniques that don't tell the member what they're really expected to do once they join. They then use this process of thought reform to groom and control the recruit until they've fully bought off on the nonsense. Now, this includes cults like Heaven's Gate. Heaven's Gate convinced its members to physically harm themselves. Now, think back a few years. You know, going back a long ways, Heaven's Gate was actually started in 1974 by Bonnie Nettles and Marshall Applewhite. Nettles died in 1985, but soon after, Applewhite started really cranking up the craziness, and, and that carried on for the next 10 to 12 years. The couple first met in 1972 when they were both on a spiritual discovery journey. During this time, they identified themselves as the two witnesses of Revelation. <laughs> now, th think about that. Revelations 11, 3 through 12. Go back to your Bible and read it. Now think about their personality type. To say they were the witnesses of Revelation is found in Revelation 11, 3 through 12. Well, it, it was so compelling that several hundred people started following them and they built this newfound religion. Now, since the book of Revelation wouldn't name the two witnesses that were there, Nettles and Apple White stepped up, raised their hand, and called themselves T and Doe. We're the ones that witnessed Revelation. Well, by 1976, the pair stopped recruiting people, and they began what's called a, a monasticism lifestyle. Now, monasticism, or monkhood, is simply a religious way of life where worldly pursuits are abandoned in order to devote oneself to all things spiritual. In long-standing traditional religions like Catholicism or Orthodox faiths, an example of this lifestyle might be the priest, the monk or the nun. Instead of secluding themselves from the world by living in abbeys, convents, or monasteries, Heaven's Gate set up shop in San Diego, California. I mean, I, I get it. The weather there is awesome. And you got a beach. <laughs> well, where better than the beach to develop your religion further, perhaps even seeing a few UFOs? Soon, Applewhite began teaching his followers that they could transform themselves into 
immortal extraterrestrial beings by rejecting their human nature. And he taught them that once they reject their human nature, they could ascend to heaven, something that Applewhite creatively called the next level or the evolutionary level above human. It's always something cooler, always something better. With Nettle's 1985 death to cancer, changes had to be made to keep his followers in line. And this is where we see this revelations and direction kind of change to fit the times. Let's listen as Marshall Applewhite describes what he believed was the most urgent thing on his followers' minds, the evacuation of Earth. Or, in old language, a couple thousand years ago, disciples, those who are trying to prepare themselves for entry into the evolutionary level above human, synonymous with the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. We're going to talk to you about the most urgent thing that is on our mind and what we suspect is the most urgent thing on the minds of those who will connect with us. We'll title this tape, uh, Planet Earth About to be Recycled. Your only chance to evacuate is to leave with us. Planet Earth about to be recycled. Your only chance to survive or evacuate is to leave with us. Now, and that's pretty major statement, pretty bold in terms of religion, in terms of anybody's intelligent thinking to most people who would consider themselves intelligent beings that say, well, that's, that's absurd. What's all this doomsday stuff? What's all this prophetic stuff? You know, intelligent human beings should realize that everything has their cycle. They have their season. They have their beginning. They have their end. They have cycles. We're not saying that planet Earth is coming to an end. We're saying that planet Earth is about to be refurbished, spaded under, and have another chance to serve as a garden for another human civilization. Now, the reason this is such an interesting time is not only because we're on the threshold of the end of this civilization, because it's about to be recycled, but because of where that finds us, where that finds you, where that finds those who would judge us, how we would speak of them and how they would speak of us. Well, Applewhite had to continue to fix some misconceptions that his cult followers had with this belief that they were going to ascend to their heavenly home in a UFO. I mean, finding an available spaceship was kind of difficult in 1997. I mean, think about it. Elon Musk hadn't even started building his own rocket yet. So Applewhite made a slight adjustment, and he taught his followers that they were merely living inside of a human body that was a container or a vehicle for their soul. Now think about this for a minute, folks. How similar is this to other religions who teach that our soul resides in a human body and that when we die, our soul would go to another spiritual realm where we would spiritually live with our loved ones? I mean, it's a beautiful thought. He added a little interesting twist to it with the vehicle idea. Uh, Applewhite took accepted religious beliefs and he twisted them to fit his own narrative, banking that something familiar sounding would be more believable than something completely out there. And it worked. I mean, to highlight this, let's listen as Applewhite uses another familiar theme the biblical creation of the world in the Garden of Eden. As you listen to this clip, you're going to hear his reasoning of why everyone needed to commit suicide when they did. It was the right thing to do, he preached. That was the only way that the earth could be recycled and a new human population could start again. 
Listen in. I'm going to be interested in your thoughts on this one. Now, you say you keep saying us. Who do you think you are? Well, I, in all honesty, must acknowledge my father. My father is not a human father. My father is a member of the evolutionary level above human, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. My father gave me, long before this civilization, gave me birth into that kingdom level above human, that kingdom of heaven, that kingdom of God. Now you can say, well, I can't believe that. Well, it's up to you whether you believe that or not. That's not important to me, even though I wish that you could believe it for your sake. For those who do believe it, stand a possibility of a future beyond this recycling time. Now you say, well, according to religious literature, I thought there was someone else that was going to come and be our savior here at these end days, that that was going to be Christ's return. Well, the name Christ might be a little confusing, or the name Jesus, because the name Jesus, of course, of course was the name given to the body that that mind that was indeed from the kingdom of heaven came and that mind was here 2,000 years ago and that mind came for the express purpose of teaching humans how they could be saved, how they would not be plowed under at the end of the age. Well, we're at the end of the age. So the one or the mind that was in Jesus, what? That mind is in me? You'll have to decide that for yourself. I must admit that I am here again, that I'm here saying exactly the same thing that I said then, trying to say it in today's language, trying to hope that for your sakes you can see what we have to offer you, for our Father offers you life. Uh, what do you think of that, folks? I mean, as you watch him and watch his personality coming forward, uh, think about yourself being back in front of him and listening to this. Now, Applewhite continued by saying that this human container, our, our body, would stay behind and that his follower's consciousness would be transferred to this new next level body. A kind of a, a real-time upgrade upon death. And with that in mind, Applewhite put in motion the murder-suicide of 39 members of his cult. Remember, Applewhite had long before instructed his followers that he was some kind of deity. In fact, he actually claimed he was the son of his god. And here's where it gets interesting. He claims he's the reincarnated son of god. Let's listen in. Not talking about human life. If planet is about to be recycled, and we see the planet as a stepping stone, planet Earth a stepping stone, that just as within a civilization, a civilization evolves upward, that each segment of civilization becomes more civilized, less barbaric in some ways, it's supposed to, not that it necessarily does. Sometimes it seems to appear to be more civilized when in fact it becomes more barbaric, more quick to condemn the rest of the world, more quick to be quick to kill the rest of the world that, that does not think as it thinks. Now think about what was happening in 1997. The comet Hellbop is approaching the Earth at its closest pass point. And now Applewhite seizes upon the reality of this event by convincing his followers that their body, something he called the human container, would stay on Earth after their suicide. But their conscience would be taken up to the spaceship and onto the comet and there onto wherever their heavenly home would be. It was the perfect phenomenon to set everything in motion. 
And Applewhite taught these principles to his believers, upping the stake, adding that he himself was also a god mixed with nettle. So nettle and him made up himself and God's son. You probably noted that I'm having a really difficult time saying God and Jesus Christ in this confusing ramble of Apple Whites. It's simply too offensive for me to do so. And so I'm going to just call it Apple Whites Gods. Now listen to Apple Whites confusing ramble where he tries to tie it all together with the name that he and Nettle gave themselves decades earlier, T and Doe. Well, I know what I just said. I said that I am the return of the son of my father. I'll tell you something that's even more remarkable. My father came with me this time came in the early 70s, took on a human form, an adult human form, helped me get in an adult human form in the early 70s, and we together helped those who came with us that were also here 2,000 years ago get in the bodies that they were wearing so that they could rid themselves of human behavior, human activity, human thinking, so that they could be ready to move into the kingdom of heaven or the evolutionary level above human. These that are sitting before me have been students of T and O, T, my father, have been students of T and O, are still students of T and O, even though T returned to the heavens in 1985. And T is my heavenly father gave me birth into that kingdom before this civilization began. Now, I'm not here to sell you on that, or who I am, or who these are. I'm here to offer you, as these are, an opportunity to know the truth so that if you can connect with it at any level, then you might survive the respading or the recycling that is about to occur. Well, Apple White's plan worked. And on March 26, 1997, 39 members of Heaven's Gate donned their brand new Nike tennis shoes and they tucked a $5 bill in their pocket, along with three quarters. Before covering themselves in a purple shroud, they each consumed a cocktail of applesauce, barbiturates, and vodka. Now, before doing so, many of the followers recorded messages where they hoped to explain why they participated in the suicide. You, you can almost see them reasoning of how crazy this sounds, somehow trying to convince us that they weren't crazy by doing it. You're also going to see some things that I found pretty interesting. So listen closely first as this young man describes how he cut all external family ties and all outside support in order to follow this mentally ill, self-proclaimed leader. You're going to hear a common theme of seeking more inspiration than anyone else. A common theme of needing to be spiritually elite and, and thus more important. And you're going to hear how incredibly vulnerable this young man is. Let's, let's listen in on this. I don't know. I just feel like I've learned so much about the, uh, the next level and uh, kingdom of God uh, and on how best to cut all ties, attachments, and addictions to self and this world. And... Uh, this is my prepared statement. It's very simple. And uh, I don't know, I think my constant asking long before I entered the class is, was the key, the, the constant um, begging uh, for the real facts, the, the real truth, as how to get out of this world and grow beyond it, and rise above it, and leave it behind, um, both self and this world. And uh, I must never forget that my free will and 
options and choices allow me to either keep looking up to the next level or to look away and um, which results in separation and death similar to cutting a leaf from a tree and as long as I look to my older members in the next level I will have unlimited growth where all creation originates in my also in my new next level vehicle or body or suit of clothes whatever you want to call it and I want to thank my father Do and T and I feel the utmost respect and honor for the price they paid to endure for my sake and my classmates sakes um, the entering into such a world as this one has become these kinds of things are really heartbreaking to watch. I mean, th these are real human beings who got sucked into this cult. And folks, as you watch this next video clip, pay close attention to the verbal and nonverbal cues. Now we're gonna talk about verbal and nonverbal behavior and communication in the Profiling Evil Academy, and I hope you're joining up on that. But, but listen closely as this follower indicates that she's choosing to commit suicide. And yet the whole time she's saying the words, she's closing her arms and clutching herself. I mean, it's really tragic to me to watch this. Perhaps it's her personality and there's no feeling of compulsion. But I'm going to be really interested in what your thoughts are as you watch her share her thoughts. And, and again, listen to the verbal behaviors and then pay attention to the nonverbal behaviors. If people would just know that we're not forced into this in any way. It's, you know, our own choosing to do it. And I'm really happy that I made this choice because there was a lot of things kind of working against me not to, I'm sure. <clears throat> I mean, I know there was people in the world who thought that I had completely lost my marbles. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't have made a better choice. And, I think I need to every day thank T and Do on the next level for even letting me be here because they don't they don't need anybody. <laughs> Just um, I could say a lot more too, but it, for some reason we always get kind of emotional when we start trying to convey our true feelings because we know I think that the media is going to just uh, whatever. They're not going to present it the way we would like to be it presented. Anyway, I wish you could all be here. I wish you were as lucky and fortunate as we are, I guess. And finally, think of the last woman who just spoke and, and, and how she tried to convey how lucky she felt that she could commit suicide for tea and dough. As you think of that, listen closely to this senior member who summed up the feelings of many of the cult members who had completely consumed the Kool-Aid, so to speak. And I was in a, this, this container was in the human world to the extent that it was part of the quote establishment. All I can say is that this is the most exciting time for us because this is the end of the class. This is everything that we've waited for. This is the end of the civilization that we talked about not only 2,000 years ago, but in prior times when we, we had association with members of the next level who came and tried to move up the civilization. We were all part of those classes also. So here we are, it's been a long 6,000 years, and the next level or the kingdom of God isn't something that you join and get to over a little six weeks course. So T and O, we owe everything to them. We're right. going to lay these vehicles down here shortly, and we're going to. What we're doing is we're going home. We're going home to those individuals who sent us here to do this task, and this is the happiest and joyous thing that you can possibly imagine. We're going home. We've got a place to go to. Now you're going to find this old crummy vehicle in a bunk someplace. That I'll be going. I'll probably be watching when you when you check it out and and observe your responses and your reaction when you look at these vehicles. And there are nothing but containers that we've used and bored for the short amount of time. So we have nothing but gratitude and joy and thankfulness.
to our older members for giving us this opportunity and we're going to be able to help this human civilization for a much greater and taller perspective than you can possibly imagine. So with that, we're going to say goodbye, and we'll maybe be talking to you again. You never know. Now, some of you may feel that the only victims of these bizarre belief systems are the participants, but it just isn't the case. Having worked these cases, I can tell you there is a lot of emotion. Strange family members of those cult members were left with questions that were unanswered. I, I mean, they were thinking, what more could we have done? The neighbors who watched this wacky group of people go back and forth must have been thinking they're just weird. And yet they were left wondering, is there something more I could have done to bring this group to the attention of authorities, somebody who could have made a difference? And of course, there are always the police officers and the medical personnel who are called to the scene after the fact. They're ones that are left to pick up the pieces and the memories that they have can be incredibly difficult to handle at times. Listen to Sergeant Robert Brunk of the San Diego County Sheriff's Office as he describes what he witnessed. I want to thank San Diego Union Tribune for this story. I think it's excellent. Sergeant Brunk was the first responding deputy to the scene. He found a side entry door unlocked on the residence and, and when he couldn't get anyone to answer any of the doors, he entered through that door. Once inside, he discovered the bodies. 39 people. Let's listen to his recollections from the scene. On my way to the call, I was kind of trying to, in my mind, contemplate how I'm going to tell the people, that I'm, the residents that I'm going to, hey, the reason I'm here <laughs> is because somebody, I think it's a prank or something like that. And when I went up the driveway, that's when things started just changing a little bit, let's say. You start feeling something's not right. just so happened that the last door that I came to was uh, like a side entry door into the residence and they had left that unlocked. It start, you almost start to get tunnel vision but then you started seeing the bodies everywhere because there was a, a room next to the foyer that they just had bunk beds out and then there were cots and just bodies everywhere. Now what was strange for us is that they're covered up. I mean everybody's dressed in a black Nike jumpsuit with Nike shoes and they've got a purple shroud over their head and they've got a patch that says Heaven's Gate Away Team on the side. There's a computer that's like Star Trek that's flashing red alert on the thing. It's like you're you're kind of pinching yourself going, is this really happening? When uh, our partners arrived that's when we decided to go back in and go through the entire house, just and it was just the two of us, um, and counted out how many people were there and uh, what rooms they were in. And I basically checked people for signs of life by rigor mortis. And there was obviously nobody alive in the house. Within 24 hours, we were given out a lot of names. We gave out the videotape of the inside of the house, which dispelled a lot of rumors about it being a fly-infested house, which it wasn't. And, uh, and it also assaged the fears of the neighborhood that there, weren't a, there wasn't a mass murder. While we were showing that tape, I, I was commenting to a buddy of mine that you could hear a pin drop. And those are reporters who had been to Beirut, they'd been to, through wars, they'd, I mean, they'd seen a lot. But while that tape was being shown, it was as quiet as a church. They would be classified as a New Age UFO group, uh, and they believed in a, a higher level and that there was a transportation device on the other side of Hellbop Comet and uh, that they could um, rise to a level above human if they committed suicide and their spirits would be transported 
via this vehicle on the other side of Hale Bop um, to, a, to a different plane. There's not a day that goes by since that happened that something doesn't make me think about it. Heaven's Gate's leader, Marshall Applewhite, fit the stereotype suggested by sociologist Max Weber. Although some who listen to his ramblings today would question how charismatic he truly was. Now, to his followers, Applegate was not only charismatic, he was also a god to them. And his cult was absolutely destructive in nature. You know, I've gained a great deal of knowledge about polygamy-centric cults during my career. Hey, folks, since we're talking cults, I wanted to mention my book, Deceived, an investigative memoir of the Zion Society cult. It, it chronicles my investigation and ultimate takedown of a destructive cult that was sexually abusing children and adults. Do you know more than 4,000 counts of assault and rape occurred in that cult? Now, I don't focus on the ugly side of what was going on, but I focus on the cult behaviors, the recruiting techniques, and the way in which they avoided detection for so many years. And then, of course, we talk about the raid and the ultimate takedown where 70 police officers joined me in hitting 12 different homes all at once in the compound. We'll talk about the court system, the court process, and the fact that 12 individuals went to jail or prison. The, the self-proclaimed leader died in prison. And then, of course, the most important thing is you're going to hear from the victims themselves, who I now refer to as survivors, as they rose above this and became the real victors in this entire challenge. I think you're going to really enjoy this book. You can get a hardbound signed copy at profilingevil.com, or you can go to Amazon and pick up the paperback anywhere in the world. Thanks for supporting us here at Profiling Evil. Now let's get back to the discussion on cults among us. I've learned from speaking to and studying the work of some amazing professionals like Margaret Singer, Yanya Lalik, and Rick Ross. Singer once categorized destructive and unsafe cults by defining three factors. One, the origin of the group and the role of the leader. Number two, the power structure or the relationship between the leaders and, and of course, the followers. And then number three, the use of a coordinated program of persuasion. More clearly said, thought reform or commonly said, brainwashing. Margaret Singer stated, in most cases, there's one person, typically the founder at the top, making decisions, and all decisions center on him or her. Imagine an inverted T. The leader is alone at the top, and the followers are all at the bottom. The overriding philosophy is that the ends justifies the means, a view that allows groups like this to establish their own brand of morality outside of normal societal standards. We're going to explore a number of destructive cults during this season of Profiling Evil podcast, Cults Among Us. The topic may be weighty at times, and it might deal with difficult issues such as fraud, physical labor, child abuse and neglect, medical neglect, sexual exploitation, and physiological or psychological and emotional abuses. We'll look at extreme examples of destructive behaviors in cults like today, Heaven's Gate, or the Solar Temple of Switzerland, or Nexium. And we're going to examine how cults use isolation to cut members off from long-standing support systems. I mean, we just talked about Applewhite. For instance, he used regimentation and tight daily schedules to maintain control of his followers in Heaven's Gate. By reminding his followers of what is right and how they are doing wrong, <laughs> without his oversight, obviously, these destructive leaders suppress and control their followers. Throughout season two, I'll reflect on the lessons that I've learned investigating cults over 30 years. We'll explore the pervasive question of many people who wonder how anyone can be manipulated into joining a cult. 
You know, it might surprise you to understand that under the right circumstances, normal, average people can be susceptible to joining a cult. But research indicates that two-thirds of cult members are psychologically healthy people who come from normal families. And only 5% of cult members demonstrate major psychological problems prior to joining a cult. Did you know that? You know, many of the people who join religious cults, for instance, seem to be cut from the same cloth. Usually they're zealots and extremists whose objective in life is to live in a community of like-minded people. People that they believe possess a higher level of spirituality than anybody else. They, they believed God would, or they wanted God to, direct them in every decision they needed to make, no matter how trivial it was. I've talked to cult leaders and cult members who said they prayed to God to find out whether they should turn right or left as they drove down a street, whether they should eat three bites of cereal or two bites of cereal. I mean, come on, give me a break. We're going to also examine some of the commonly found characteristics in cults, such as group leadership, uh, group self-perceptions, or the elite feelings that some of them have. Many have charismatic leaders at the helm, somebody that everyone else considers as infallible. The members often are enamored with the leader's knowledge of scriptures or special insights they have or insight into the constitution or other special gifts that they perceive. We're going to explore how many of these groups often display zealous and unquestioning commitment to the cult and the leader. Some may even call the leader their God or their King. Every dictate will be followed as evidence of cult members, admiration and devotion in these kinds of groups. We're going to examine how cult members are often directed in all of their day-to-day -day decisions, including goofy things like what to do or how to think. Again, think of my example, praying about whether you should turn right or left. If cult members question or doubt the cult doctrine or the leader, they're often shunned, banished, or even punished. We're going to explore this dynamic. You know, it's, it's weird because the slightest criticism or inquiry regarding the leader's directives can result in being ostracized, humiliated. It simply isn't tolerated in many destructive cults. Now think about that as you think about other cults where people can openly express differences. They can choose to quit and walk away. Recruiting is also a major pastime for cults, and we're going to talk a little bit about recruiting. They actively look for new members who are like-minded. Once cult recruits are secured, they often become isolated from their external support system, their family, their loved ones, and it leads to loneliness, depression, and uncertainty. This is when the other cult members will often love bomb the individual getting them to recognize that the cult can provide everything they need and seek. <laughs> Those love bombing sessions are interesting. They undoubtedly lead to discussions about who joins a cult. I mean, we all say, I would never be crazy enough to join a cult. Well, Dr. Margaret Singer taught something really important. She said, quote, it's not one type of person who gets enmeshed with cults, but rather a person who has a combination of factors occurring nearly simultaneously. She went on to say, I have found two conditions make an individual especially vulnerable to cult recruiting, being depressed and being in between important affiliations. We are especially prone to cults kind of influences when we're not engaged in meaningful or personal relationships, jobs, educational or training programs, or some other life involvement. Well, folks, as we explore some of the cults among us, I hope that you'll be empowered along the way. I hope you'll be empowered personally and for your family members. For those who have loved ones in a cult, I hope that this might help you understand what's happening inside those organizations. 
that it might buoy you up a little bit for what could be a long and sometimes disappointing future as you pray, hope, and fight for your loved one to return. Remember, cult members are taught that there is an us versus them reality and that associating with anyone outside of the mindset of the cult is dangerous. These things take time. I look forward to this journey with each of you, and I look forward to reading your comments down below as you interact with each other. I hope that you'll be kind and patient in your comments and, and in your personal assessments. And I want to thank you for listening to Profiling Evil Season 2, Cults Among Us. We're just launching, and I think you're going to find it really compelling. You can find Profiling Evil podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. And again, folks, don't forget, hit the like and the subscribe button and get all of our notifications and videos from Profiling Evil. Make sure you're watching for us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And please consider our channel memberships. They are a great way for you to show your appreciation and thanks. And hey, you can join for as little as 99 cents a month. Or you can become an Academy member for $4.99 a month where you're going to get additional insight, early releases on videos, and, of course, the Academy courses before anybody else gets them. We're also going to spend some time in personal chats each month with those in the Academy. So thanks again, and we'll see you soon at the next crime scene. Mm -hmm.